our next guest, Corey Seidman, who does a fantastic job, Philly's pre-post game live analyst, writer, reporter for NBC Sports Philly, co-host at the yard. He does a lot of things. Follow him on Twitter at C Seidman, NBC CS for the Phillies. I bet that in the summer, mm-hmm. like baseball season, Corey's availability, like if, if they were to hit Corey in the summer for this survey, he probably has no time. Well, we're lucky to get 10 minutes with him. Exactly there. right. Point. Exactly yes. right. Harry Mays, Aton Chandler. Appreciate the time, Corey. Yeah, you know, you guys are you're right. I mean, during the uh, during baseball season, my 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 time is very formatted, even on an off day. You know, it's uh, but it's look, it's nothing to complain about. It's it's a great job. The other night, I was at CBP, kind of looking at it. Uh, you know, past center field. Now that that Holiday Inn is gone, and you can really see the skyline, I was just thinking to myself, what a job this is. You know, being at the park and just watching Nola versus Strasburg and having this you know great scene in front of you. So can't complain. Yeah, absolutely. And they had Strasburg. Uh, I mean, they, they raked him. They had the team on the ropes. And all of a sudden, the, the guy you think is just going to sort of lock it down, get you through the seventh inning with, with ease, and Aaron Nola uh, got lit up himself. And next thing you know, they're in a game uh, in extra innings, and they lose. And then they end up losing the series after yesterday. I don't even know what that was last night. Uh, but, you know, the lineup just went, went silent. And, and Pavetta has just been atrocious in his three starts. Um uh, Corey, and I want to know what what is your bigger concern? Is it some of the bullpen guys, or is it some of the starters that we thought were going to be pretty good? Right now, I think the bigger concern is the starting rotation. I mean, Nick Pavetta, there were huge expectations for him this season based on some of his peripheral numbers last year and how well he showed up in spring training. But uh, it's just through three starts, the issues with Nick Pavetta have been the same things we saw in the latter half of last season. He just catches too much of the plate. You know, it's great that he has a mid-90s fastball, and every once in a while, you know, he'll have a game where his breaking ball is really sharp and he's missing bats with it. But too often, he's using too much of the plate. In fact, I looked at his chart last night of all the balls that he allowed in play, and I think there were 17 total, and only three of them hit any corner. Hmm. 14 of them were, like, really in right the middle in the of the plate, and there was... Yeah, and there was nothing in the top half of the zone. It was all like middle, middle, and then in the lower portion. So not much changing of eye levels. I mean, he he admitted last night that he needs to be better. His teammates need more from him, and he's absolutely right about that. On the flip side, you know, Zach Eflin has been really impressive so far. So Lights out. The Phillies are, yeah, the Phillies are getting something out of one of their young starters so far, but it's just not enough. It's a lot this offseason with Aaron Nola was – in baseball, it's really in all sports, but in baseball especially, you're not the same player year to year. You know, you can be great one year and have a good year the next, or great one year and average the next. And when we look at the off seasons, we tend to envision that everything that happened last year will stay the same, and that these new additions will, you know, make this team better. Well, who's to say Aaron Nola was going to have a two three seven ERA again this season? You know, maybe maybe that's closer to three. And I do think that he's going to figure things out. He's too good. You know, he's just been homer prone in these last couple starts. He's also faced the Washington Nationals lineup twice in a row that is really good. I mean, even without Bryce Harper, you know, you combine Rendon Soto and Victor Robles at the bottom of the order, that's a high-powered offense as well. So I think Nola's going to get back on track, but – this is just kind of a reminder that you can't just assume that year to year you're going to see the same production from any player. All right, Corey, if there's an issue with the starting rotation, and I know we're going to get to the back end with the bullpen as well, why not kick the tires on Dallas Keuchel? Uh, so me personally, I'm not a big Dallas Keuchel guy. Like, I, I think that he is good. I think that he's probably, you know, even, even if you sign him at this point, having not pitched, he's probably still going to give you more than Vince Velasquez would. But when it comes to Keiko or Craig Kimbrell, it's not just a question about the players. It's the question about player and money. Like, mm-hmm. first off, you know, with Kimbrell, for example, there are so many teams that could use him, which shows that it's not simple. You know, the Nationals, the Braves, the Cubs, the yeah, Dodgers, least. <laughs> the Phillies. Yeah, like every, every, really every team in the National League that's a contender could use him in their bullpen. So it should, it should show people that his demands are still pretty high if he remains unsigned. And the same is true of Dallas Keiko. You know, I do – I feel for the guy as much as you can feel for an athlete who has all these millions of dollars because yeah. Dallas Keuchel was a former Cy Young winner, and he probably thought that he was going to get a big contract this this uh, this winter, like five years, maybe $100 million, or even if it was three years, it would be in that Jake Arrieta range of $75 million, and it just never surfaced because the guy showed signs of decline. Uh, you know, he's never really missed all that many bats. Last season, high ERA, most hits allowed in all of baseball, so... 
you know, the fact that all front offices these days seem to view players the same way. They seem to value the same skills. Pitchers that don't miss bats are not in demand, and I think that's what happened to Dallas Keuchel's market. I don't think the Phillies are going to really make a push for him. I think that if they if they felt they could get the guy on a one year deal, maybe. But the, the issue that I keep, you know, coming back to is the Phillies are about seventeen million dollars below the luxury tax threshold, and maybe they go above it. But that's not just a consideration this year; it's a consideration for the future as well. Because every year you're over it uh, consecutively, the penalty increases. So if you think that you're going to be spending more as the years go on, you want to push that back you know, passing that threshold until you absolutely need to. So if you sign a Keuchel, if you sign a Kimbrel, it might limit your flexibility in the month of July when a bigger need arises. Hey, Corey, do you foresee um, Gabe Kapler and the Phillies settling in on a guy to close out games, or is this going to be an, uh, you know, an entire season again of this sort of closing by committee, which is kind of uh, going on throughout baseball? I mean, you know, some teams – you know, do have lockdown guys that you know are going to be the guy, but it is becoming more and more of a uh, sort of a mentality. Uh, do you see that continuing here? Or do, you, do you think they settle in on a Sir Anthony or a Naris or, you know, who's the guy? Well, so, like, I think if Sir Anthony comes back and say he saves a game and he looks good doing it and then the Phillies go to him again to save their next game and he succeeds again, I could see them settling in for a little while. But with Gabe Kapler, the manager, and without a true closer on this roster, I think there's always going to be an element of bullpen by committee there at the back end. When the season began, uh, MLB.com put out a list of every team's closer situation, and it was just so stunning to look at because I counted 12 teams out of 30 that had a legit closer in terms of, you know, this is the guy who you can expect in the ninth inning every night. Uh, the other night when Ed Ubrey Ramos came in to try to save that game against the Nationals, had he gotten that save, the Phillies would have had three on the season, and none of them would have come from Sir Anthony Dominguez or David Robertson, who everyone would have predicted to be the two ninth-inning pieces going into the season. So, I mean, the bullpen use is unpredictable, but I do think that if you can get a guy starting to feel comfortable in a specific role, that the Phillies would stick with him for a little while, whether it's a Hector Neris or whether it's a Sir Anthony Dominguez. I still get the sense that the Phillies want to use David Robertson wherever – that leverage situation is, whether it's the eighth or the ninth, and kind of the same goes for Pat Neshek. But, you know, if I'm like playing fantasy baseball, for example, I'm not rushing to go get any of the Phillies relievers to try to get saves. So it's sort of just like riding the hot hand until they have a bad outing, and then you try somebody else. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I wow. mean, pretty much. Like, look at what's happened with Sir Anthony Dominguez, for example. You know, he had a couple of bad outings, and his next appearance is the sixth inning because the mm-hmm. Phillies want to get him. Um, you know, they want to get him a low leverage spot, and he right. looked really good his last two outings. So that's what I mean. That like, if they have a four-one lead tomorrow night in Miami, and Sir Anthony Dominguez comes on and strikes out the side, I think you would see him in the next save situation. Amazing. Yeah, and, and if you're getting better outings from your starting pitching, is that less of a concern of a long-term strategy, Corey? Yeah, and I think like that's where that's where this all kind of comes into play. Like the fact that Vince Velasquez pitched five innings um, in that first game against the Nationals meant that the bullpen was needed, and it meant that the next night, Nishek and Robertson and Adam Morgan were all unavailable because they had appeared six times each in the, Phil- in the Phillies' first nine games. So I think like that that's the thing. You're getting five-and-a-half innings average out of your starting pitchers, which really is kind of a league average these days. Uh, but when that happens and when you're a winning team, the temptation is going to be there every night to use your top relievers. And you don't want these guys making 90 to 100 appearances in a season. So it's going to be tough for Gabe Kapler to balance that and manage the bullpen every night. That's really his biggest test. That's the biggest test of any modern-day manager is how to use the bullpen. And, you know, that game earlier this week against the Nationals, when they, when they blew it, that, that was, a lot of it was on Aaron Nola. But it also was just an example of when you don't have your top relievers, things can really get shaky. They wanted to use Hector Neris for more than one inning in that game, but he needed 30 pitches to get through the eighth. So that plan quickly went by the wayside. Well, on the other side, aside from last night, the lineup has got uh, has got me really thinking about bigger and better things because you remember Charlie Manuel used to always talk about it's not hitting weather yet. You know, hitting weather comes in like you know mid to late May, and that's when some of the big bats would get going. Uh, here it is early April, and I know it's a nice you know some nice days here, but it's not hitting weather yet. But they're already hitting. Yeah, and that's pretty promising. I mean, for example, 
uh, to your point, last night, Matt Adams crushed the ball 400 feet to left center field. That's out if it's like May, June, July. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's the, the, with the wind and the cold air, uh, that ball kind of died at the warning track. Same with an Anthony Rendon opposite field fly ball last night. I think both of those balls would have been out in midsummer. The Phillies, meanwhile, had been showing a ton of power without it even being, um, you know, the, the, the weather where the ball's flying. So I think that bodes well. The fact that, you know, we've already seen signs from, like, everybody in the lineup except Cesar Hernandez of what everybody can do. Bryce Harper has four homers. Michael Franco has four homers. He's thriving in that eight spot. JT Romuto is getting into the act. He had a three-hit night the other day. I mean, Gene Segura continues to be an extremely pesky and tough out atop the lineup. And I think the Phillies are probably pretty happy with what they've gotten so far out of Andrew McCutcheon. The batting average is pretty low, but he's taking a ton of pitches. He's walking. He's showing some power. So, I mean, it's, we've already gotten a sense of how good this lineup can be. I said before the season that it's the deepest one through eight in the National League, and I, I still maintain that. I think the Dodgers and Phillies are going to be the two best offenses, maybe throw the Brewers in there as well. Yeah. But there's just not a soft spot, especially when O'Double's hitting. Corey, listen, appreciate this. This was awesome, giving us some insight and making us feel a little bit better, but also understanding some issues that could be plagued long term unless they're addressed. At C. Seidman, NBC uh, S, right, is – I just had it up here. I'm sorry. At yeah, C. At, Seidman, NBC, NBC S. Yeah. See, I had it right. You got I did. It. I, I should have trusted I should have trusted myself yeah, off of memory. Yourself exactly. too often. Way too much. Great stuff, Corey. We'll see you on TV, man. Thanks, Thank Corey. you. Okay, thanks, guys.